life throws things at you that causes you to change what you're doing. And uh, I went to prison in New Hampshire 15 years ago and did eight years in the New Hampshire State Prison. And while I was there, a friend of mine became really concerned about me. And so he contacted someone that he knew was a chapel volunteer at the New Hampshire State Prison, a great little woman named Jean Mexker, who is in her 80s and comes to the prison all the time to visit the guys and, and just chat with them. And uh, he said to Jean, uh, my friend Phil Horner's in there, and I, I want to make sure that he has someone to visit him. So Jean started asking around, and she found a guy named Chris Dornan. And Chris was a freelance reporter at the State House in Concord. And Chris said, was getting close to retirement, and he was looking for something that he could do to make a difference. And so Chris said, oh, I'll, I'll go visit him. So Chris came in, and I started just telling him stories because prison is full of stories, all right? And Chris said, you ought to write some of these down, you know? You really ought to write some of these down. And, and I, I couldn't tell him that I didn't have enough time. <laughs> so I wrote him, I started to write him down, and I'd send him out to Chris, and Chris would edit and say, well, say this a little different, do this and that. And, and gradually, uh, we got into uh, a habit of, you know, sharing stories. So when I got out, um, I was uh, part of the group that formed Citizens for Criminal Justice Reform in New Hampshire. And one of the things that Chris said was, hey, why don't we collect the stories and start posting them to a blog? And so as it turns out, the website for Citizens for Criminal Justice Reform has a blog called Notes from the Land of Oz. And uh, there's maybe 50 uh, stories there. And has anyone visited that website? Has anyone read any of those stories? Oh, good, because I'm going to use a couple of them exa as examples today, and I didn't want to bore you if you'd already read them. That doesn't mean that it won't bore you anyway, but at least it'll be the first time you've been bored by them. So why storytelling? Well, first of all, I've got to tell you that I've been really impressed at this conference because at every opportunity when we're not sitting listening to somebody else speak, we're telling stories to each other. And you pass people in the hallway, you, you, you walk into any room, and there are two or three people sitting together talking intently, and you catch snatches of the conversation, and they're telling their stories or someone else's story that they love. Um, and, and so, you know, storytelling is just one of the things that being in the situation that we're all in calls us to do. But storytelling is really vital. And, and here's a story for you. Back in the 1850s, the United States was deeply divided about a political issue, slavery. All right? And in fact, the, the United States Congress had just enacted something called the Fugitive Slave Law, which basically said, if you had lost a slave because he'd run away, you could hire somebody. And they could go up into the northern states that were free states. And if they found your slave, they could kidnap him, capture him, and take him back down south because he was the property of somebody down there. Um, and this was enacted by Congress. So you can see how ambivalent the whole country was about the issue and what was going on. And so there was a woman in Connecticut, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and she, her father was a prominent abolitionist. And she decided to write a story. So she started a serial that was published in an abolitionist newspaper that eventually became Uncle Tom's Cabin. All right? And it was basically just a story personalizing slavery for the readers. And um, later, about 10 years later, when the Civil War was going on, Abraham Lincoln had a chance to meet Harriet Beecher Stowe. And he called her the little lady who started this big war. Um, because her story galvanized and touched people's hearts in a way that the statistics about slavery and that sort of thing never could, all right? That story made people start thinking and it touched their emotions. Bigger than that, the story was really popular across 
the Atlantic in England. And if the South had a chance of winning the war, it was that England would come in on their side because England needed the cotton that they produced to run its mills. And England was the only country in the world that had a navy big enough that could break the Union blockade at the South. So if they had a chance, they had to do it. But Harriet Beecher Stowe's story had touched enough people's hearts that England stayed out of the war, remained neutral, and you know the rest is history. So story can, can really take an issue and take it from the impersonal statistics into the personal touch of people's hearts. Okay? And I think that's the point that I, I want. If I don't make any other point, that's the point I want you to take out of this. Here's a recent story. Gay marriage. All right? 10 years ago, just 10 years ago, much less than 50% of Americans thought it's not a good idea. We don't want it. Okay. Now, more than 50% of Americans say, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I can live with that. Why? What has changed public opinion? What do you think? Is it statistics? Television. It's television. Exactly. It's television. All right. It's Ellen. It's Will and Grace. It's the modern family. It's these shows that tell stories. And the stories portray people and uh, and they personalize the issue, and they change people's attitudes. It's stories that have changed people's attitudes. It's, it's not statistics, it's not talking about the Constitution, it's not talking about rights, it's not talking about any of that. What changes people's attitudes is story, okay? You know, human beings, our brains are cued for story, okay? That, that's the way we're put together. I mean, you think about little children, we, tell, we start by telling them bedtime stories. We tell them fairy tales. We tell them stories to make sense out of the world because that's the way that our brain is put together. We make sense out of our environment through story. Okay? It's not through facts. It's not through statistics. It's through, it's through story. We pass on the accumulated wisdom. You know, Think of the religions of the world. Stories, that's what it is. They tell stories. The stories explain and help us to put into context what uh, we experience in the world around us. So um, our, our brain is, is cued to use stories. And it, it, there's been some really interesting studies at Princeton. I, I was reading about them when I was preparing for this. Um, some of the psychologists at Princeton have done uh, studies where they actually hook up uh, uh, EEG machines and, PET scan, and do PET scans on storytellers and listeners. And, and it's really fascinating research. What they find is that if, if the person who's talking is giving statistics and, and giving bullet facts and that sort of thing, that the part of the brain of the listener that, that, that lights up is just the language portion. They're just kind of analytically listening to it. But once a narrative story starts, then what happens is other areas of the listener's brain start lighting up, emotive areas, even motor areas. So if we're talking about rowing a boat, the, the part of the brain of the listener that would be useful in rowing a boat starts lighting up. So the, the storyteller and the listener's brain starts syncing together. It's just a really fascinating research. Um, it's also interesting that when per someone gets absorbed in a story, they detect fewer false notes. You know, when somebody is making an argument for us, we automatically want to think of the counter arguments. We're all automatically trying to pick apart, is this true or is this false? But when somebody's telling us a story, a story is like a gift, okay? When you tell somebody a story, you're, you're giving something to them. You're imparting something to them. And, and people receive it as a gift. And oftentimes, don't even bother to analyze and think about the false notes. I mean, and we've all experienced this. Who, who's watched World War Z, the movie, the zombie movie? OK, I mean, zombie movies are just really illogical. The more you think about them, the more you think, oh, that's really just so a bizarre, you know, I mean, that can't be true. But when you're watching the story, you don't think about those false notes. It's only afterwards when you start, 
analyzing. But when you're absorbed in the story, yeah, you really become scared of those zombies, and you really, you know, are thinking, is Brad Pitt gonna make it? Uh, and that sort of thing. And so the story kind of takes over, and it influences our emotion, but it also influences our ability to critically think about things. And so in some ways, story is like the Trojan horse. You know, we know the story of the Trojan horse, okay? You know, the, the, the Greeks said, this is a gift to the gods, and we're gonna leave it behind. And the Trojans accepted it and took it into their city. And then, you know, the men that were hidden inside kind of broke out and took over the city. And stories are sort of like that. They can have meaning and implications that if they're told well, the reader takes in those things. And just like Helen or Modern Family or whatever, you know, once you've listened to the story, you, you kind of have absorbed the, the implications to go along with it. And it's much easier for you to change your opinion, change your thoughts because of stories. Stories are also memorable. You know, uh, okay, well just think of the lectures that we've heard that, since we've been here, that the, the main sessions. Lenore, Lenore is a great storyteller. Can you tell me one bullet point that she gave you? No, but I bet you can tell me several of the stories that she told. Why? Why can you remember the stories and not the bullet points? Because the stories are memorable. They, they stick with us, unlike you know, logical bullet point arguments. We can memorize a logical argument, but you only have to hear a story once and you can tell it back because it, it engages our brain that way. And, and, and stories carry, they help us to interpret the world. You know, you walk in and your kids are arguing. And you say, what's the story here? Right? Because you've come in in a moment in time and you need to interpret that moment. And what you need to interpret that moment is a story. Okay, well, she called me this, and uh, you, know, this, uh, you can pe put together the story, and now you interpret what's happening and you act on it, okay? So, so the stories, they, they carry meaning, and they also have the ability to inspire us to action. In fact, here's an interesting quote from Steve Denning, who's one of the directors at the World Bank. He says, slides have listeners dazed. I've experienced that often. It says, prose remains unread, reasons don't change behavior. When it comes to inspiring people to embrace some strange new change in behavior, story storytelling isn't just better than the other tools, it's the only thing that works. Okay, only thing that works. So my question to you is, who's telling the stories about sex offenders? Law and Order is telling you, oh yeah, that's the, we, we all have seen Law and Order episodes where that nasty, sleazy sex offender is out there and he's, you know, luring uh, kids in and murdering them or whatever. Who, you know, who else tells stories about sex offenders in our society? Well, there was a movie uh, probably 20 years ago, I don't know, called The Woodsman. Oh, that was yeah, amazing. Yeah. That was a good movie. Okay, yeah, that that's, movie. that, The Woodsman, if you haven't seen The Woodsman, watch it. But that, that's an exception. But bad bosses. Yes, sure. That's an exception. Yeah, that's true. And there are some exceptions, but yeah, most of the average person, the story that the average, I would, I would guarantee that most people haven't yeah, seen The Woodsman. It has a select audience. Yeah. Most people, the stories that they get are from the nightly news. And what is the nightly news telling you about sex offenders? Once an offender, always an offender. Right, right. Because, because, Things, the night in the news is there to sell ads. You gotta understand, the TV is not there to inform you, it's there to sell something to you. And so we wanna get the most listeners and violence is much more newsworthy than nonviolence, right? And, and, and people who repeat offend, that's interesting, but somebody who lives the rest of their life as an upstanding citizen, well, who's going to write a story about Who's going to tune into the news to listen about that, right? So fear, something that in inspires fear, is, is much more than something that's reassuring. Yes. I've, I've tried to testify at a hearing before the House Judiciary Committee in New Hampshire after about a bad bill that was motivated by an awful story. Okay, after a victim gets up and tells her story, you might as well just not testify. Because the story is going to overpower 
any kind of bullet points that you can make as to why this is a bad bill, okay? So, but does it have to be this way? That's the question that I have. Is it possible for us to tell stories that, that will get heard? And, and, and how are we gonna do that? So I think that, you know, stories invite stories. They do. Right. They, they, they you do. Know. So like, you know, Mark Klotz was, was mentioned in the last thing. And, and, you know, my son who's on the registry, you know, when he was five years old was when Paul Klotz was abducted, 10 miles from our house. In a similar house plan, where when you walk in the door, the children's room's right there, and the parents' bedroom's further down. So I could remember what it was like to be a parent and to feel I could not protect my son. Right. And now, I am now in a situation again where I cannot protect my son. But it's a different story, and then I begin to talk about that story. How do you get the story out there? Well, let's talk about that. First of all, Let's, let's talk about the kind of stories that we need to tell, okay? And, and here is a quote that Mr. Rogers carried around in his pocket, all right? Now, you all know who Mr. Rogers was, most likable person, all right? And he used to carry around in his pocket a little card that had this quote on it. Frankly, there isn't anyone you couldn't learn to love once you've heard their story. Okay, now that's profound. That is really profound. Because those are the kind of stories that we need to tell people. Stories that humanize this issue because the stories that the media are telling are stories that dehumanize. Now I'm gonna take, I'm gonna bore you, maybe, but I, I, have, a, I have an 800 word story here that, that I'm going to read to you, all right? And I just want you to listen, and what I want you to listen for is, is it possible, ask yourself the question, is it possible to tell stories even about people that have done awful things to humanize them in a way that people can accept? All right, I want you to listen to this. This is, this is my own experience, and this is the kind of writing that I'm gonna help you to, to develop. The first time I met Chris was at a rehearsal for the Catholic Choir. Chris was from Kentucky. I figured maybe he was a lapsed Baptist or a Methodist, but definitely not a Catholic. But most of us in the choir weren't Catholic. We just wanted to sing, and the choir was respite from the daily grind of prison. Chris was tall, he had a boyish face, he wore an easy smile, and he spoke with a slight lisp. There was a childishness in his manner and an impish gleam in his eyes. Now most of the guys in the choir were in for sex offenses. I heard Chris had molested a five-year-old boy. I'm not sure what had brought him from Kentucky to New Hampshire or what led to his crime, but by the time he was arrested in the middle of winter, he was living in his car. He used to joke that coming to prison was a relief, but prison for child molesters are, in prison the child molesters are the lowest of the low and victimizers of young boys are somewhere below that. Every emotionally wounded prisoner or guard sees in them the image of his own childhood abuser. Prison life for these guys is hell. They get beat up, their stuff gets stolen, they get doused with urine and feces, and everywhere they go they get called names, pervert, baby rapist. Ripper. It's incredibly difficult to make the mental transition from likable guy on the outside to monster in prison. Sex offenders search for ways to cope with the shame and self-loathing they feel. Some remain firmly in denial, inventing convoluted stories to explain their innocence. Some retreat into isolation. I know one guy who, after being brutally beaten, never left the 48-man pod on which he lived for 10 years except for a once a week trip to canteen to buy the food he prepared in his own cell. Some of us worked hard at our prison jobs, rising to the top and winning at least the approval of a supervisor, if not our peers. But there are some who mocked their abusers and embraced the label and wore it with a perverse pride. Chris turned to cartooning with a schoolboy's mischievousness. He invented a character called 
Rippy, and he drew him in outrageous satires of prison life and the absurdities of the prison sexual offender program. And one day he tried to mail a copy of his work to his sister in Kentucky. The mailroom intercepted it. He was called to the office to meet with the program director, and she told him this kind of mockery proved he was unrepentant and would guarantee he stayed in prison until his maximum. She recommended a transfer to the Berlin prison, where there was no sex offender program available. He got a disciplinary write-up and a punitive transfer to Berlin, where he became the target of a new group of tormentors, and all his stuff was stolen yet again. Chris knew nothing about legal procedure. But with a paper and pencil, he wrote a letter to the New Hampshire District Court. He told the court about his cartooning and how he had been treated by the prison staff. And the federal judge gave Chris the benefit of the doubt and held a hearing. The judge seemed amused by the exploits of Rippy and found that the prison had violated Chris's First Amendment rights to free speech. He ordered the DOC to return Chris to Concord and replace all his stolen items. Well, when Chris got back to Concord, he joined the choir. The choir director, Nick, was an accomplished musician who was doing seven years for inappropriate contact with a teenage actress. This particular day, he handed out copies of a new song. It was a short piece written by John Bell, Take, O oh, Take Me As I Am. Guys, said Nick, this is really an easy piece and there's no harmonies to learn and here's how it goes. Nick played through the tune on the chapel's electronic piano. I followed along, singing the words in my head. Take, O oh, take me as I am, summon out what I shall be, set your seal upon my heart and live in me. It had a simple flowing melody and it ended on a hanging note that led back to the beginning. One of those songs easily sung over and over and I liked it. After the choir learned the tune, Nick announced, okay, I want the whole choir to sing it through twice and then I'd like someone to sing it as a solo. He looked around, Chris, why don't you try it? Okay, said Chris hesitantly. We began. When Chris's turn came, he started tentatively. Take, oh, take me as I am. Gaining confidence, his clear tenor voice soared to the high notes of set your seal upon my heart and live in me. He started into the second verse, but his voice began to quaver. Before the last line, he choked and collapsed into sobs. Someone put an arm around him. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry, Chris whispered. The rest of the choir sat silently with our own thoughts. That's all right, Nick murmured. We understand. All right. Now, there's a guy who molested a five-year-old boy. And what he did was awful. He could easily be the monster, all right. But this man is not a monster. He's wounded. And if you can tell a story that shows his humanity, you can disarm the people who would point fingers at him with hate. All right. And that's what I'm hoping that we can see, how you too can write those kind of stories. Everybody here can tell a story. All right. Can you put it down in writing in a way that others can read it and can change their attitudes? Let's, let's, let's see. Let's talk talk about some of those elements, OK? Um, so uh, that's, that is a style that is commonly called creative nonfiction, OK? And creative nonfiction is a genre that's relatively new. I mean, use, people have been doing creative nonfiction for a long time, but calling it creative nonfiction is relatively new. But it has some characteristics that make it very appealing for storytelling. And if you learn those characteristics you'll, and keep them in mind as you're writing your stories, you'll be able to effectively write stories too, okay? First of all, creative nonfiction has a personal voice. It's not a lecture. It's not a newspaper report article. It's conversational. It's me talking to you. Okay, and so it's written in the first person. Uh, I, when I was in prison, this happened to me. I, I saw this happen. My, you know, my experience in life, I'm going to tell and share it to you. So, so the, the, the writer has to be present in the text. So when you're writing, it's you talking, all right? You're not giving facts. You are sharing your story. 
the reader has to feel spoken to, okay? When I was reading that, I was speaking to you, each one of you, and you can, you can hear that in the tone. So, uh, so a personal voice. The second thing is veracity, which means truthfulness, all right? Um, and just like if any of you were in the workshop about um, the media that, that uh, Lenore just uh, gave in the next room, um, it was emphasized uh, during that workshop that you have to be truthful. And whether you're talking to a reporter or whether you're writing a story, a nonfiction story, it's important that you be truthful, all right? You've got to strictly adhere to, adhere to the truth even when it hurts, even when it's embarrassing. I could have written that story and not said anything about Chris's crime, okay? I could have done that. But adding that in makes it truthful, okay? I'm not whitewashing the situation. I'm being brutally honest about the situation. You see, honesty brings you respect in your writings because there's few people who can be truly honest about themselves, right? I, I mean, who can be truthfully honest, right? The closer we get to being honest about ourselves and sharing that with other people, the, the more they can be honest about themselves, okay? And that's what we really want, isn't it? But when we meet somebody who's honest about their own failures, it disarms us be, because we know Man, if I had done that, I wouldn't say a word about it. You know, I, I'd never speak about that. When somebody can say, this is what I did, and be honest with us, then we're disarmed. Because suddenly we, we gain a, a respect for the individual that we may not have had before. So veracity, OK? And then reflection. Um, it's not enough to live life and say, this is what happened to me. You've got to live life thoughtfully, all right? When you write an article like this, you've got to show the reader that you understand where the sticking points are and that you've worked through them, okay? That, that, um, you can, that, that you've developed an opinion about it. And although you're not opinionated, and you may have had a mental struggle to come to that point, uh, you have done the mental work necessary to put that vignette in some sort of larger picture, okay? Um, so I'm going to ask you right now, if you have a piece of paper, you can jot it down. If you've got an iPad, even if you just want to do it in your mind. Uh, what I want you to do is to think of something, and we all have this, something that you would love the public knew about the whole issue of sex offenders and the registry and all that stuff. Something that is not commonly known, but you wish that people knew it. Just take, take two minutes and jot a few ideas down. What moves you? What drives you? What would you really like to communicate? All right, so, so that's the place to start. A theme, if you'd like. Anybody like to share what they, sure. I'd like to uh, let the world know that, uh, and I tell the story a lot, uh, that uh, uh, people on the registry, uh, it's, it's not black or white, it's multiple shades of gray, and that many of the people that I've met on the registry are there because they were falsely accused by somebody, and it's their word against the other, and they're on the registry for life. And many of them, for when I tell them what the crime was, the people are just like, they shouldn't be on the registry. But sure. to most people, they think it's black or white. Either you're a multiple baby <clears throat> raper or you're not. Right. Sure. Yeah. Someone else. Registrants make great employees. Mm -hmm. Good statement. Good. Good statement. Yeah. John. False accusations and wrongful convictions happen more often than many people realize. Right. Yeah. Uh, it can happen to you too, and know that, that the criminal legal system is not about the truth, it's about creating the responsible party and making it look like a monster. Right. Okay, all of those are really good points. I can guarantee you that you could stand up in front of a crowd and say that sentence, a crowd of non people who are sensitized to the issue, and say that sentence, and it will not change their opinion. Okay? 
how could you change their opinion? That's what we'll go to. Um, so let's talk about storytelling. Let's go on now. So we've talked about you have to have a, use a personal voice. It's my story. Use veracity. Don't blur the truth. Show that you've done your mental work in your story, that you've thought through the implications and, and you've put it into a bigger picture. Um, so choosing form, how, how, do we, how do you choose form? And you can do creative nonfiction in a lot of forms. I mean, you can do it in the form of a letter. You can do it in the form, uh, in, a, in a lyrical form, which basically just is inward looking and talks about your feelings and, and that sort of thing. You can do it in a narrative form, like this story about Chris that has a, a, a storyline and, and, um, and uh, you know, progresses through a series of events. You can do it in a descriptive form that just uh, that just looks at the world from the outside as you see it. Okay, a, a, a vignette of the world. Um, you know, there's memoirs, there's uh, biography, there's uh, there's all sorts of ways that people use creative nonfiction. You got to remember though that the form, this form, is the container that your story is in, and it's like the serving platter that the that the meal comes on. You want it to be pretty, but it's not the the main idea. You know, the main idea is what's on the plate. It's the it's the flower pot that the plant is growing in. The plant is the main idea. The pot we want it to be pretty, but that's that's it's not the main idea. So the form. Think of the form as the container. Um, one of the important things is length. Okay, now creative nonfiction can be any length. It can be a biography, it can be a book, uh, but few of us are gonna sit down and write a book, okay? I mean, we may eventually someday. But books are made up of chapters, and chapters are made up of vignettes, and my encouragement to you is to start with the vignettes, okay? If you grab onto this, and, you, and, and this is what you're meant to do to help out things, you'll write those vignettes and eventually they'll coalesce into something bigger, okay? But if it's just a blog, like mine right now is just a blog, um, that's okay too. Because as long as each one has some kind of internal coherence, um, that's, that's the beauty of it. People love stories, and if, if they just read one of your stories, you've impacted them. So I, I try to go for somewhere between 600 and 1,000 words. That's basically two to three typewritten pages. Um, that's long enough that you can develop a storyline, but not so long that you bore people, okay? Um, you, and, and it's the type of thing that you can write in a short period of time. You know, if you're not writing the history of a case from, you know, the accusation to the indictments to the blah, 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 you're just writing about one aspect of it. Um, and, and then they'll, they'll fit together. Um, you gotta, which means you're going to have to be willing to leave some things out, okay? And you, you're going to have to abbreviate. Um, you know, Shakespeare said, uh, what, brevity is the soul of wit? And in fact, uh, y in, in this kind of creative nonfiction, less is more. Try to be concise. Try to put things into, the, tr try to get to the punch and put things in a way that keeps people there and, and, and ready to continue to hear. Um, again, talking about truth, let me just say this, that there are two kinds of truth. There's emotional truth and there's factual truth. Okay, both of them are true. Okay, factual truth is this happened and then that happened and then that happened and on this day that happened. But the emotional truth is I felt this way, I felt that way, I was moved to tears. I, th those are emotional, that's just as true, okay? And your story has to deal in both those kinds of truth or it's gonna sound flat. It's either gonna sound like you're a navel gazer, just always talking about your feelings, or that you don't have any feelings and you're just the, the historical narrator tell, telling events. So you gotta deal in both kinds of truth. But what if you don't remember exactly? I mean, this happened 10 years ago, right? I don't remember exactly. Well, reconstruct as best as you can remember the events when you're telling your story, okay? The, the important thing is not that, for instance, with dialogue, dialogue is I mean, who remembers exactly what words the person said and you said back? 
when you're writing dialogue as part of your story, you've got to write the dialogue as best as you can remember it. So that if the other person who was in the dialogue would read it, they might say, well, you know, I know those weren't exactly the words they said, but yeah, that's the gist of it. Okay. That, that's the way that it has to be. You, you, ha you, you can't make up things because once you start making up things, somebody's going to come along who's going to shoot a hole in your story, all right? Somebody who knows the truth. Now, if it's a factual thing, did that happen in 2000 or 2001? And that's important to include in the story. Look it up. Okay, I mean, we live in the age of Google. There's no unanswered questions, all right? You can find out the facts if you, if you need those kind of historical facts. Make sure that they're correct. But most of the time, you don't need those historical facts like that for these kinds of stories, all right? Um, if you don't remember, say I don't remember. In, in your story, you can say, you know, I don't remember what happened then, but the next thing I remember is blah, 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 okay? Or if you're not exactly sure, use a qualifier. Say, well, as I recall, you know, this is what they said next, okay? Um, that's perfectly honest to do that, and that is a way to deal with the truth when memory is a little cloudy from time and there's no record that you can go back to to look it up, okay? So, so that's, um, that's the important thing. You know, the truth can be hard to tell, and um, uh, many of the things that we have done are embarrassing, they're shameful. It's hard to tell it, okay? You've got to get past that, all right? You've got to be willing to, to be open, all right? Your honesty is a gift to the reader. Your truth speaks with authority. And it imparts a sense of shared humanity, okay? We're all humans. We all fail, okay? It gives, as I said before, it gives the reader permission to confront his or her own ghosts, okay? Because they're there. You know they're there. Okay, we like to all pretend that we have it all together, but none of us do, right? And so, and, and sex offender laws are largely written from that attitude. I've got it all together, but you're the problem, you know? And our story has to subtly undermine that kind of attitude, all right? Um, and then tone. Uh, let me talk finally about tone in this section, and then I'm gonna read you another story, and then I'm gonna give you another short assignment. Tone is, is the attitude is, uh, of your writing. Um, it could be angry. It can be humorous. It, it can be ironic, sad. It can be anything but whiny, all right? Nobody wants to read whiny stories, okay? So um, your writing cannot be a plea for help, seeking sympathy. Self-pity, oh, poor me, that can't be it, all right? If you write those things, people aren't going to read it the next, they're gonna, not going to read anything else you write, okay? The first time they read that, oh, yeah, okay, I know where this guy's coming from, all right? So uh, you, you've got to have made peace with those things before you start writing down, all right? Um, your goal also can't be revenge. No revenge stories are allowed, okay? You can't have revenge on a judge. You can't have revenge on a prosecutor. You can't have a revenge on a false testimony against you. You can't be writing out of revenge. It doesn't mean you can't write the truth. It means you can't write them vengefully, okay? If you do that, it's gonna come through. No amount of truth is going to cover over the fact that you're trying to get even. And it, it, that can't be the motivation for your story. Oh, to so go back to whiny for a moment? Sure. So what do you think the elements are of not being whiny? Um, I'm going to show you, all right? Here, let, let, me, let me write. Uh, I, I told you it's OK to be angry. And let me, write, let me read you a story where, now just listen. And you can critique me. If you say, oh, you're really whiny there, get over it. You're, you're, not, you're not doing what you tell us. But OK, listen to this. I reported to the receiving and diagnostics unit at the New Hampshire State Prison a few weeks before my release. I was going on a doctor's visit. Prisoners arrive and leave through R&D's dungeon-like ground floor. 
And I figured this was the next to the last time I would see its drab brown walls. Doctor's visits are a distraction from prison life, an opportunity to look at the world outside the wall. The enjoyment is seriously dampened by handcuffs and leg shackles. Sitting in a doctor's waiting room trussed up in leather and chains is humiliating. Conversation usually stops when you come shuffling and jangling through the door, a guard at each elbow. People look away. Even chatty receptionists fall silent. Today would be different, I told myself. I'd been approved for parole. I was classified as C2. I didn't need to wear handcuffs to be outside the walls. The prison has a five-tier classification system linked to a prisoner's level of supervision. Most guys are C3. They live in the prison's general population. Close custody and maximum security prisoners are C4 and C5. Prisoners like me with a C2 classification can live beyond the perimeter fence in the minimum security unit. I waited in the concrete holding cell for half an hour before the transport team arrived. The jangle of shackles echoing off bare walls announced their approach. One of them barked, Horner, as they entered the room. Holding cell two, answered the guard at the desk. The electric lock snapped open and I stepped out of the steel barred door. Hands against the desk corner and spread them, said a pimply faced kid in a uniform. I didn't recognize him. Must be a newbie, I thought. He patted me down and reached for the cuffs. I kept my hands at my sides. I'm C2, I announced. The new guy glanced at his partner. You still have to wear the cuffs, he said hesitantly. Why? Classifications have said I can live outside the walls. But you're still behind the walls. Everyone who leaves the prison gets cuffed. But I've made parole, I argued. I'm just waiting for the interstate compact paperwork to come through so I can go home. The newbie's partner stepped in to show him how it's done. Are you refusing the transport, Horner? He asked, because we can cancel your appointment. It makes no difference to us. I weighed the opinion, uh, I weighed the option and decided I wanted to see the doctor. I reluctantly offered him my wrists. He snapped on the cuffs and buckled the leather restain, retraini, restrain, <laughs> retaining strap around my waist. I was hogtied, but I wasn't ready to concede this fight. I had spent the last eight years being restrained and caged like an animal, and I was sick of it. Now I had the parole board's blessing, the he's safe enough to live in polite society stamp of approval. These goons were treating me like I was fresh from the courthouse. So the fact that the parole board and classifications has said it's safe for me to live outside the walls doesn't mean anything? They exchanged exasperated looks. The more experienced one said, look, Horner, Take it up with the warden. And then he added, what if we happen to run into your victim out there, huh? How do you think she would feel seeing you loose? It was said with a generous helping of contempt for me and my kind. I was mom momentarily flustered by the casual reference to my crime. As I lifted my feet for the young guy to shackle them, I said, so all this stuff is theater. I raised my manacle hands as far as the belt would allow. It's all a show for the public. Their only answer was to grab me by the elbows and escort me a little too fast for the shackles down the hall into the waiting van. I sat in silence in the back seat. The guards rode in front, bantering with each other and ignoring me like a bad odor. I tried to tell myself they were only doing their job. But eight years of prison had done its work. I had become like my keepers. All I could feel was contempt. Now, that's honesty, and I try to express the emotions that I was feeling, and I felt angry, believe me. I felt angry that day. But what I want to express is not, I'm really angry at these guys and I want to get back at them. I'm trying to express that this is what life is like if you're in prison, okay? And this is how it is, okay? And this is how it makes you feel, but don't feel sorry for me, just recognize this is what we do to humanity when we put people in prison, okay? And that's, that's how I want those stories to go. So this is what I want you to do now. I want you to think of a story, that one that you know intimately, that could illustrate one of those points that you wrote down, okay, earlier. 
And I want you to jot down in a paragraph or two how you would tell that story to an intimate friend. Okay, don't worry about literary style or anything like that. You're telling that story to a friend, okay? I'm out there in the hall, and I said, you know, could you, so what's been your experience with this or that? And you say, well, you know, here's what happened, okay? So I want you to just kind of, you can do it mentally. I mean, if you're tired by the end of the afternoon, <laughs> you don't have to sit there and laboriously write it out. But I want you to think in your mind, how would I tell this to my best friend? Okay, how would I tell this story? Uh, because that's the starting place for creative nonfiction. So just, I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that. Well, the other day I was at the fun wash doing a load of laundry, and a handful of teenage boys came in and started horsing around, and, and then it took a turn where they started getting violent. One snatched the hat off the kid, and he fought for it back, and punches were thrown. And I stood up like any man would do, and I turned and left. And it reminded me of being in prison when I walked by the TV room, I saw two guys duking it out, and one guy just waved on another one. And I had to turn my head and walk away. And of all the humiliations of being on the sex offender registry, the worst is abrogating my rights as an adult, my responsibility to step in and protect kids. That's great, Ron. That's great. Yeah. Good thinking. Yeah. Good work. Yeah. It'll sound well, you know. Okay, it, okay, it can sound whiny now because you're not done with it. Editing takes the whininess out. <laughs> um, I'll never forget the day the world fell apart. It's not what you think. It wasn't when I was arrested, bad as that was. It wasn't even when I had to call my wife that night to tell her I had been arrested, as truly awful as that was. It wasn't even when I was pronounced guilty in a trial by court martial. As awful as that was, it would come a year later. For me, the day the world fell apart was an ordinary day in 2008, in the fall of 2008. On that day, I was told to report in full dress uniform to the military district of Washington to hear the charges read. I was alone, my lawyer couldn't be in the room, and as I stood there at attention, hearing this captain, who obviously thought I was already guilty and had me convicted in his mind, I was standing at attention, I couldn't show any emotion, and all I could think back to was a day not long previous when I had been standing in that same uniform at attention to get promoted. And the people who had really pulled in a lot of political favors to have that happen. That was the day the world fell apart because that was the day I felt like I had betrayed everything I ever believed in and everyone who ever believed in me. To this day, over 15 years from that time, that's his memory is as fresh as it ever was. And it's the reason I know that I will never, I could never go through that again. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. Good. Yes, John. You're familiar with the Ten Commandments, aren't you? There's uh, one of the commandments that says, uh, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now, maybe when you were in school, Someone, oh, well, Roger, oh, I, I know that he's got cooties. Or uh, Lisa was, Lisa couldn't get to the toilet in time. She kind of wet herself. And, you know, you make up stories like that. But thanks to two young people who broke the Tenth Commandment, I'm now in my 17th year of being on the sex offender registry. There were times, certainly in the first months and years, that suicide was a somewhat attractive lure. Maybe like a fish, I'd snap at it. It took some time seeing everything that was normal stripped away. Being cut off from members of my family, ostracized by the community. Like I said, it took some time, even being diagnosed with depression.
But you know, there was something that I remembered. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I began to crawl out of that hole late in 1999 when it just suddenly hit me in thinking about the accusers and the general environment that had uh, led me to make a plea bargain. I am not going to let those bastards win. You can't really understand what it is to go through like that. I'll try to answer your questions. What do you want to know? Uh, good. Any, does anybody else want to share? I, I don't want to cut anybody off, but yes, back there. Um, I'm kind of looking through it through my son's eyes, so sure. that's okay. That's all right. um, so my life on um, the life of a parolee. I used to be a coach, a teacher, a preacher, and now I am treated like an alien creature sitting alone on a bleacher. I am a human, only now with polys, bracelets, CYs, and, U and UAs. Every day is so confusing. I feel so torn. I just want justice reform. At last, my past doesn't predict my future. Did you know I was in prison two and a half years? Six months later, I have a great job. No more tears. Respect, reflect, restore. Family, friends, support, and oh yes, therapy with not so much support. And that's just where I got so far. It's kind of through the eyes of a mom yeah. for my son. One more, let's have one more. Huh? In Kuwait. Uh, yes, John. In Kuwait. Uh, I think they didn't have time. There was loud pounding at the, at the door I opened one eye to look at the clock, 4 a.m. My wife screamed, what is it? Who's at the door? Still in a daze, I, I, I ran to the door to peer through the peephole. There were two uniformed men waiting, sheriffs verifying my address. My wife was in a panic and my three-year-old emerged from his room in tears. What is it, Daddy? Who are these people? I just turned to him and said, these men are only doing their job. I felt really ashamed for how my sin had affected my family. Okay, thanks for sharing. You know, every one of us could tell a story like that, and, and I know that you all have stories, and you, you, if you haven't written them down, you at least have them in your mind, okay? So, and, and you know, for some of you, I feel like, well, what am I doing <laughs> standing up here talking? You guys already know how to do this. Just go out and do it, all right? But, um, but let me just talk to you a little bit about what takes that story that you've written and makes it into a truly good story of creative nonfiction, okay? Because you're throwing your story out into a hostile world, okay? And so you want it to be the best that you can tell, all right? And I think that you want it to be artistically told as well as truthfully told. And, and that's what I'm kind of encouraging you to do. And I, I think there are people in this room, probably everybody in this room, has the ability to do that. Okay, you can do this, okay? You can tell your story in a way that is great nonfiction. I mean, in the way that anybody reading your story will get to the end of it and say, wow, even if they don't agree with the point that you made. Because good writing is good writing regardless of what you're saying, okay? And so that's what I'd like, I'd like to talk about now, and this is the last little didactic portion of the workshop. And then we'll kind of work on honing down your stories and, and, and putting them into creative nonfiction. So um, being creative in the creative nonfiction means that you access poetic and literary uh, techniques 
that take this above the narrative that this is just how it happened and put it into a form that really engages the reader. And um, so there's, there's a couple of elements of it, all right? It's really created, it's really made up of three things, okay? It's made up of scene, summary, and musing or reflection. And you'll be able, once you've written a story, you'll be able to go through and see how these elements are part of it. Okay, the scene is like the camera panning back, okay, and presenting the overview. And oftentimes you need a scene passage in order to set the stage uh, for the reader so that the reader understands. The summary is, uh, I'm sorry, that's summary. The scene, <laughs> summary is the panning back, okay? And you need a summary passage to set the scene, okay? The scene is the close-up focus, all right? So dialogue is scene, okay? Where the time in your story moves kind of in real time, okay? She said this, and, and then I said that, and, and then she said this, and, and then this happened, um, and then I felt this way, okay? That's a scene, I'm sorry. So it's, it's real time. And then the summary is, and then three years passed. And during that time, I, I didn't even think about this conversation. And then one day, and now you go back into scene, okay? So your story is going to alternate between scene and summary because you want to bring the, the listener or the reader into the moment. You, you don't want to just say, well, here's how it was, you know, uh, and, and do it all summary. You want those opportunities to bring the listener into the moment. So you want to have close-ups. But then most stories need summary. Otherwise, now, honestly, if you want to learn how to write scene, read Hemingway. Okay. Read Ernest Hemingway. Okay. In fact, there is a great story. Has anybody ever read this, the short story by Ernest Hemingway, Hills Like White Elephants? If you've never read it, go to your library, look up a, a, a volume of Hemingway, or just go online, and it's online, and read his short story, Hills Like White Elephants. The story, Hills Like White Elephants, is written entirely in dialogue. Entirely. It's a short story. It is beautiful. It's beautifully written, and it's written entirely in dialogue, right? And you jump right into the moment, and he doesn't give you any summary, none. And so you wonder, what's going on here? What's going on here? And then he gradually reveals everything through the dialogue. And at the end, you will say, wow. Um, and it's, it's a very short story. But if, so if you want to learn how to write scene, read some Hemingway. Okay, but most of the time we're going to need to fill in with summary. Okay, because we're not Ernest Hemingway. Wish that we were, right? We're not. But um, but so you're going to need to write some summary. You're going to you're going to need to sort of make those transition times, and then musing and reflection. Okay, the story is really not complete unless you take the opportunity to think about it. You know, when when you say, you know, there must have been. Whatever. Or I, I always wondered why. Th that's the musing that goes along with it. That shows your interior life to the reader. Okay, this is how I I work to make sense of of this ex uh, experience. Okay. Now we talked just a little bit about dialogue uh, for the scene. Okay. Um, dialogue has to be realistic. Okay. Um, most of us write differently from how we speak, okay? And so it's important when you're writing dialogue that you read it aloud, okay? And if it's got clinkers in it, you'll hear it once you read it out loud. Oh, man, no, I, gosh, I wouldn't use that word. I would have said this, okay? Use contractions. Most people say, I cannot do that. They say, I can't do that. So if you say, I can't do that, when you write it, you write, I can't do that. You use the contraction, okay? Dialogue needs to be realistic and 
Um, if you're not a college educated person and you don't use the word retrospective, don't put the word retrospective in your mouth, you know, in a dialogue. Because you, you didn't say that and you wouldn't say that. You, you would use a simpler word, okay? So make the dialogue realistic and the best thing to do is to read it out loud. Read it out loud to yourself, read it out loud to somebody else. Does this sound realistic? Does this sound like what I, what I actually said and how I would have said that? I don't remember exactly the words I used, but this is the gist. Is this how, you know, does this sound good? Okay, revise, revise, revise. Okay, when you're writing dialogue, it's just crucial that it sounds right to the reader, okay? You don't have to say, he said, and then I said, and then he said, all the time. Once you set the, once you set the scene, you can go back and forth in dialogue without indicating that there's a change in speaker just by starting a new line, okay, in the text. And I'd encourage you to go and read, you know, go to Notes from the Land of Oz and just look at how I structure dialogue. That's, that's how you do it. And, um, and, and so it, it doesn't become, you'll avoid the repetition. But you also got to avoid too many descriptives, okay, like he snapped, you know, she said sarcastically. Um, because if that information can be deduced from the dialogue, let the reader deduce it from the dialogue. Don't tell them, okay? The reader will feel sort of spoken down to a little bit. If it's clear that this was an angry statement that was being made, and so I don't have to say he said angrily, because he said it angrily, you can see that, okay? So, so let the dialogue speak for itself. Occasionally, if it's an ambiguous sentence, you might have to somehow make it known to the reader that it was said in a certain tone um, that, you know, was <laughs> ironic maybe. Um, so so av avoid those kind of uh, descriptives if you can get away with it, all right? And then finally, the last thing that sets creative nonfiction apart is poetic elements. And I, I'm glad that we had someone who used a little poetry um, in, in that. Um, we all learned poetic elements in high school English class, didn't we? You remember that? Yeah, we, we, we learned that. Um, I mean, use the ones that you feel comfortable with, but poetic element is what takes writing from the everyday into the good writing, okay? And um, f figurative elements especially, metaphor and simile and, and those sorts of things, personification, where you make one thing stand for, you know, a human em emotion or thing. Symbol, symbolism is good. Irony, I use all the time. If you, <laughs> if you read Notes from the Lands, Land of Oz, and if you could say there's one predominant tone, there's irony going on there, okay? Um, not sarcasm, but paradox, overstatement or understatement, uh, situational, ironic situations and things like that. The world is full of those things and, and those will make your reader chuckle if nothing else, okay? Um, so um, think about these poetic elements and as much as possible, bring them in. Now you say, but I've forgotten poetic elements. I, I really don't, I'm not a poet, I, I really can't do that. And I'm going to make a recommendation to you and that is you get uh, a book by Shrunk and White um, if John's shaking his head. Uh, Shrunk and White um, ha have written a book um, that is called Elements of Style, and it was first published by, way back in the 30s or 40s, and the white in Shrunk and White is E.B. White, who wrote Charlotte's Web. Um, so, but this is a great little book. It's just pocketbook size, and it'll give you sort of the correct form to write things in, but it also sort of gives you great examples of how to use poetic elements in your writing. And I just, it's the kind of thing that if you're gonna do creative writing, you ought to read through it once a year, all right? Just to remind you, um, this, is, this is what it is. And then of course, to read some good creative writing will help you to read with your eyes open to recognize these poetic elements and say, oh yeah, that's really clever how she, she did that, you know, how she, she took that metaphor and, and wove it into the story and, and sort of brought it through. 
Uh, try not to be contrived. I mean, you can be really contrived in these things. And that just kind of comes across flat, usually. But, um, but, but this is, this is the, the, the fun part of the creative part of creative nonfiction. And, and I encourage you to do it. All right, before I give you the last exercise, I'm gonna read you one more 800 word or so story, okay? And this is in fact the most recent post that I, I put up on Notes from the Land of Oz. And um, what I want you to listen for is scene, summary, reflection, and poetic elements. See if you can pick out any just from this, okay. While doing some carpentry for a customer last week, I saw a photo of a family on a ski slope. The guy looked a lot like Dave. I couldn't remember the last time I'd thought about him. The next day, I was on another job site near a church that calls itself a worship center. It was one of those one-story functional buildings that says our gospel is so not about appearances. Looks like the kind of church I used to attend. You know, back in the 80s, Dave was the leader of the college group that started this church. And then the other night, I dreamed I was back in prison. It's the default setting for my dreams these days. I was searching for Dave. And next, I was sitting in my cell holding a photo of him on a ski slope with his family. I gazed at his familiar smile until it sprouted a mustache and became someone I never knew. It woke me in a panic. Dave and I met at a parenting seminar 20 years ago, and we hit it off. We both had young kids and lots of mutual friends. Dave made me laugh with his quick wit. We shared a love of flower gardening. I was strictly a perennial guy. Dave dabbled in annuals. I admired the cleom that grew in his yard, six-inch pink and white fireworks on waist-high stems. Dave and I volunteered for several church mission trips to Russia running summer camps for a fledgling congregation there. We were a good team. I had the ideas, Dave had the organizational skills. When we were planning a trip, we'd often meet for breakfast at a local Greasy Spoon. One of our camp programs needed a stage prop, a plywood and poster paint time machine. We built it in pieces and created it for the transatlantic flight. At the airport, a clerk with a Finnish accent asked what was in the box. Oh, that's our time machine, Dave deadpanned. Is there anything in the box besides the time machine, she asked. Dave and I looked at each other. No, nothing, he said. Good, she replied, and moved the crate to the baggage conveyor. We laughed about that for weeks. Is there anything in the box besides the time machine? The morning of our last breakfast, Dave picked me up in his minivan. I had been reported to the police the week before. We rode in strange silence. After a while, he asked, so you screwed her just like that? No, I said. I didn't have sex with her, as if denying that detail would make my behavior less reprehensible. I don't remember what I said after that. It didn't matter. I had betrayed him. Our friendship was slipping away and no words, no tears would bring it back. I was learning the dimensions of the box I had built for myself. I saw Dave once more sitting a few rows behind the county attorney in a crowded courtroom. He never acknowledged me. I passed his house on a trip from county jail to prison, handcuffed in the back of a cruiser. A few of Dave's early Cleome blossoms nodded goodbye. Some months later, another church member sat across from me in the prison visiting room during his one and only visit. He told me we had never been friends. How could you have been my friend when you were hiding so much? The question hung in the air as he stood to leave. It was true. I had worked so hard at appearing to have it all together. The other day, my wife passed through our former town and stopped at Dave's house to catch up with his wife. They had a friendly chat about life and the kids. Phil would really like to hear from Dave, my wife said. I don't think that will happen. Dave has a hard time dealing with what Phil did. I wish I had that time machine. I'd go back and erase the pain I caused, relive those lost years, and laugh with friends like old times. 
Is there anything in the box besides the time machine? No, nothing. All right, you recognize the elements of creative nonfiction in that story. Um, scene, okay, there's conversation, conversation at the airport, conversation between me and Dave, uh, the last day that we saw each other. There's summary, I, I had to tell you a little bit of how I got there. There's definitely musing and reflection, okay. Wish I had that time machine. Um, and there are poetic elements. Did you pick up any of the poetic elements there in the story? Yeah. What's the major symbol in that story? Box. Okay, there's a box. Okay. There's prison cell box. There's the box that we packed the, the time machine in. There's the box that I built for myself by my actions that hurt other people. You started on your way to carpentry. There, I started on my way to carpentry job. That's true. So, so there's boxes there. Um, how about personification? You don't remember when I passed when we passed yeah. Dave's house? The Cleum blossoms nodded goodbye. Well, they don't nod goodbye, but they stood for a, the person of Dave who was saying goodbye. All right. So those are the kind of poetic elements that you, you you work into the story, and that's what takes the story out of the mundane. Yeah, this is what happened to me too. This is writing that wants to engage the reader, that's asking you to, to listen and, and, and to, to put things together and to think deeply about this, okay? So here's my challenge for you, and we're sort of getting out of time here. So I won't make you do it now. We'll just we'll kind of end because it's getting late. My challenge for you is to take that story, okay, that you have in mind or that you wrote down and rewrite it using these elements, okay? Rewrite it into a story. Don't make it a long story. One page is fine, okay? But use some of these elements to rewrite it, and I'm going to give you my email address, okay? And I want you to email it to me, and I'm going to edit it for you and send it back. Because one thing I'm going to tell you is get a good reader, get a good editor. I've got two guys who are both college-educated guys who, before I post anything on the website, I send it to them and I say, read this. <laughs> edit it, tell me what I need to change. And they do. They're really honest with me, and they help me a lot. And that's what I would encourage you to, to do, too, because we all can get into our own hands and think, oh, yeah, I mean, this is self-explanatory. Well, it's not really. <laughs>